everyone uh, to this International Connection series. Uh, the, uh, the first order of business today is to introduce uh, Governor Holden. Governor Holden is chairman and CEO of the United States Heartland China Association. So to kick it off, I'll turn it over to you, uh, Governor Holden. Well, thank you very much, Larry. And I'm delighted to uh, speak to the audience today. Uh, this is so important for us and it's also important for you. Uh, the United States Heartland China Association was formed back when I was governor. I, I made a, uh, I was chairman of the Midwest Governors Association and I watched a, a lot of the industries, a lot of the jobs leaving our part of the country, going to the East Coast or the West Coast. So I started thinking about what can we do to bring that back? And uh, I saw China as an opportunity. Nobody was really talking about China at that time. And so I made the trip to, to China, announced that Missouri was gonna open its first office in China, uh, met with the folks there in China, and attended the university and then came back and, and taught at Webster University for several years and opened a Confucius Institute uh, in the state of Missouri. And what I found is that if you work with these people and understand them, uh, you have a much better, better opportunity to, to get things accomplished. I'll, I'll never forget, I was speaking to a, a group of elementary students at a, at a school in Beijing. And the teacher walked up to me and, and leaned over and said, I understand that your youngest son who's with you today is turning 10 uh, today, is that correct? And I said, well, yes it is, and <laughs> smiled. And she said, well, some of the students uh, want to give him a little gift, is that okay? Uh, well, what's a father to do, you say, of course. And one at a time they, they came up and gave him a little, little gift. And I, I turned to my wife and I said, I can work with these people. Cause I, I got to know the humanity that's there. Doesn't mean we don't have differences, but it, the fact is we've got to figure out what those bridges of opportunity are to work together. And so when I came back, I uh, got involved with Ad Sandra Adley Stevenson, started the, the uh, uh, Midwest China Association, and we've expanded that to the U.S. Uh, Midwest China Association, which is the 20 states from the Great Lakes to the Gulf. We were a 501 uh, bipartisan organization. Uh, and our goal is to build the ties of opportunity between these two cultures. So it's a win-win for everybody. And uh, I would uh, say, and I talked with uh, Peter uh, a couple of weeks ago, I think now, or maybe a month ago, and bought his book uh, that I've, I've read. And I would encourage everybody to buy a copy of that book and read because he really goes into trying to explain and understand uh, our culture and the Chinese culture. And my, my feeling is if we do what we need to do and promote the things that we need to promote, we can build those relationships that'll stand the test of time. We're a 501c3 bipartisan uh, and we will work with anybody that plays it straight and, and wants to see some, some real things done. We just finished a major event in, in Iowa. We had the uh, new ambassador to the United States uh, there. We had uh, the former ambassador uh, from the United States, uh, Terry Branstad there participating. Uh, several, uh, several other people were all involved in all of this and over 200 people participated uh, in that, that program. Uh, and I think they announced the largest soybean sales uh, that they've had in many years uh, has occurred. So the opportunity is there for all of us to really work together, find ways to make it uh, a meaningful relationship for both. It doesn't mean that we don't have our disagreements, but the fact is we've got to find common ground. And that, that's what we're trying to do. That's what we're working on. And uh, I, I'm looking forward to the rest of this conversation. Thank you, Governor. <clears throat> so what I'd like to do now is to uh, welcome everybody and give you a, a little more specifics about uh, what to expect uh, over the next uh, hour's discussion. 
So my name is Larry Taylor. I'll be your moderator. Uh, I'm a board member of the World Affairs Council uh, of St. Louis, and I'm a longtime US to Asia business practitioner. Uh, this is the International Connections Series of the World Affairs Council, uh, and it's in collaboration with the United States Heartland Association. This is the, the, uh, the second uh, of two, and I'll talk about that in a second. The World Affairs Council is one of 90 uh, chapters around the United States. Uh, we in St. Louis are dedicated to bring the world to St. Louis and the world of St. Louis connecting out to the world. Uh, the uh, previous session, uh, was focused about the importance of the relationship between U.S. and China uh, writ large. And today we'll uh, dry, dive down into uh, more of the commerce. If you'd like to, to see the first of these, I commend it to you. It's on the World Affairs Council's YouTube channel. Uh, the date is April 28th. And uh, what we'll do next is I'll introduce the panelists and uh, I'll ask a, a series of, of questions to get the conversation started. And then we invite uh, those who are attending. I see there's several dozen. Uh, if you would uh, ask your questions and type them into the to the Q and A uh, uh, box at the uh, bottom of your screen, and you can start asking your questions as soon as you think of them. You don't have to wait. Uh, so uh, to our panelists, uh, special appreciation goes uh, uh, to Diane Long, who's uh, up in the middle of the night uh, in Shanghai. Uh, Diane Long is past chairman and governor of the AmCham in Shanghai and, and is an active um, member of the uh, U.S. Uh, Heartland China Association. Uh, Lisa Mark is uh, administrative partner and chief representative for the Shanghai office of uh, Haynes and Boone LLP. Lisa an expert on cross-border investments and M&A activities in the U.S. and Europe. And Lisa is also uh, a board member at the association. And thirdly, um, Pete Walker is author of Powerful, Different, Equal, Overcoming the Misconceptions and Differences Between China and the U.S., uh, the book that uh, Governor Holden just commended to you. Pete is a former partner at McKinsey & Company, who's been in China over 80 times and is an expert on Chinese culture and philosophy. So I'll go around the room and ask you to uh, tell us what is your role in U.S. to China commercial relationships and from a personal interest point of view, how did you get there? What's your journey? Um, so, uh, Diane, uh, distance goes first. Uh, let me start with you. Well, thank you, Peter. Uh, I mean, Larry, sorry. Um, thank you for the invitation to participate in the panel today with Lisa and Peter. Um, well, I came, um, you know, it's been 37 years, my time in China. And I did not realize when I came in 1985 that this would be a life sentence, um, but it has turned out to be an incredible ride as we have witnessed and participated in the evolution of this uh, country as it has opened up to the world. About half my time has been spent in manufacturing, supply chain, logistics, uh, within uh, factories for product that was for export. I've held uh, Chinese jobs in China as well as regional jobs overseeing Vietnam, Philippines, Indonesia, as well as China. In the last 12 years, uh, I've been with Xanadu Enterprise, which is a boutique consulting firm that works at the intersection of strategy and execution. What we found um, through our corporate experience um, everyone is, has a corporate background. What we learned from that experience is, is you can have these beautiful strategies that are laid out um, at the boardroom or by wonderful consultancy firms, <laughs> um, but then how do you actually bring it to fruition on the ground? So um, in addition to business, as you can imagine, I've lived my life here. I've grown up here, as I like to tell people. I've raised a family. Um, I've been on several boards and founders of nonprofit organizations. And I sat as a trustee on a Concordia International School, which actually is an LCMS, a Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate School. So I have a connection to St. Louis and I have visited St. Louis. So I'm pleased to be here virtually. Thanks. Thank you, Diane. Lisa, if I could turn the, the question over to you. Sure. Um, so I'm a lawyer by trade, uh, and 
regarding commerce between the U.S. and um, China, I actually shepherd a lot of investments uh, from Chinese money or international private equity firms that are based out of China, uh, both in Beijing, Shanghai, and Shenzhen, over with their investments over to the U.S. and Europe. Uh, we, of course, also deal with um, uh, Western companies that are currently in China, but um, I'm sorry to say that in the past two years, most of that dealing has been uh, kind of discussions about how they could limit their footprint or withdraw from China because the operating challenge is fairly difficult. Um, now, I'm not, I'm not talking the, about the very, very large multinational corporations who have made huge amounts of investments into China and still view China as very much a um, massive market that they need to uh, be participating in, but more on the middle market side and more on the kind of uh, smaller kind of SME side, uh, the operational challenges in the past two years within China especially if it is doing cross-border uh, trade, uh, has been difficult to surmount. Uh, as for my personal background, I actually grew up in Hong Kong, came to the U.S. for education, and then through a series of happenstance, got pulled back to first Hong Kong and then to China. Um, and so I've learned to fulcrum, especially when putting together transactions, uh, to fulcrum between how business is done in the Western world uh, and how business is done in, in Asia and particularly in China. Um, and I must say that the business people or the business community in both places are sophisticated, but they are sophisticated in different ways. And so a lot of times when you're negotiating deals between the two, um, you have to adjust how you do business and adjust your expectations or else there's going to be miscommunication. So that's, that's what I do. And um, I track the money flows mostly. And uh, it's been very interesting in the last six months. Sophisticated differently. I imagine we'll come back to that. <laughs> Pete, can I uh, turn the question over to you? Yeah. Yeah, so my first interest in China came from a spiritual journey I went on when I was in my mid thirties. The question I was asking was, who died with a smile? Uh, I studied the biographies of my favorite composers and artists. They all flunked. Anyway, to make a long story short, uh, I quickly discovered I was much more Eastern than I was Western. Led me to study Buddhism and Hinduism for quite a while. Found them too specific. And then I stumbled on this wonderful little book that became my Bible in life, which was the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu. So uh, that really took me to China. Uh, when I hit 60 at McKinsey, I had to get out of all governance. That was about a third of my time. I was on the board and did other things. So I said to my assistant, I'm going to China every six weeks for a week. I did that for 12 years, uh, serving Chinese insurance companies and financial institutions, uh, not really MNCs, all local companies. And uh, in, in the course of doing that, I just got to know a lot of Chinese people from many walks of life. And as I continue to read the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal and the FT talking about the unhappy oppressed people in China, the corrupt government, the irrational approach to life, the communist uh, dogma, uh, I said, why after 80 visits have I never met any of these unhappy oppressed people? Uh, why haven't I met this, uh, people in government who were other than very highly educated, very committed to the country, and, uh, and very effective at getting things done? Uh, so, yeah, I decided to write a book, which I entitled Powerful, Different, Equal. Um, I can tell you that uh, that book in the U.S., had such low sales that when they sent me my royalty check for the first year, I couldn't take my wife out to dinner in New York on it if I wanted to have a nice wine. Uh, I then published the book in China and had a book launch co-sponsored by Peking University and Cidic Publishing. 
We had 640,000 hits at the book launch. For a while, the book was number one on, in the foreign affairs category. And, and it just showed to me how starkly the difference was between the two countries in terms of wanting to understand. There's just very little evidence the US wants to understand who China is and how they're different. Uh, and, and the Chinese, who I find already have a pretty deep understanding of the US, wanted to learn more. Um, so, so my first uh, angle in on this subject is I'm kind of a missionary on this subject of U.S.-China relations and helping people see in a balanced way. Uh, my book is not pro-China. It's not pro-U.S. It's simply the facts. And making the core point is that the two very different models are rooted in very different histories and cultures. And my second angle in is I'm the trustee of the China Institute, which has been around for over 95 years. The China Institute focuses very much on the cultural differences between the US and China, looking to close the gap. Um, uh, another fellow trustee and I are now leading an effort to leverage the corporate market and the economy much more directly in this area of closing the gap. So that's kind of my two angles in. Uh, th th thank you. Uh, so the uh, what came out in, in hearing your discussions is that, um, there are different perspectives. What what we're treated to in the news here um, might not be what uh, those of who have spent time on the ground uh, sense. So let me um, um, let me pose a question since we're trying to talk about commerce and Maybe if people are doing business together, they're they're not um, being so angry. They're finding new ways to to uh, further the relationship. So, what's your perspective on the balance of opportunities uh, that there are to be found, and then the challenges uh, to make it happen? And uh, I don't know, Lisa, is it okay to start with you with, for uh, this round. Sure. Um... Opportunities and challenges, I think, um, and, and we can take it directionally. Uh, the outbound investment out of China to the rest of the world actually grew 9.2% year on year for 2021 as compared to the year before. Um, it grew 7.9% for Q1 of 2022. So China is still doing outbound investment. And these are not completely just state-owned enterprises investing around the world trying to buy up resources. These are investments by private enterprises seeking technology, seeking kind of uh, difference in business model, uh, seeking diversification. Uh, so on one direction, I am still seeing a great deal of interest uh, in uh, kind of Asia money trying to invest in the rest of the world. Uh, and so that's one opportunity. Uh, the second opportunity, of course, is for all the ink that has been spilled about, oh my God, the Chinese economy is dropping off the edge of a cliff because of the COVID lockdown, blah, 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 blah. The IMF and Fitch are still predicting a GDP growth of 4.4% and 4.3% respectively for China for this year. Now Q2, because of the COVID lockdown is probably going to be very difficult. There might be a zero growth or even a contraction, but um, a lot of international firms, even though they are issuing guidance or uh, earnings guidance, saying, hey, Q2 is very difficult. They do expect to make up some pace uh, with the end of this year. They expect that China is going to get out of COVID lockdowns and kind of pick up the pace, particularly given that the Chinese government uh, has indicated that they want to achieve a 5.5% GDP growth, which means if you have a contraction in Q2, you're going to have to kind of press the gas in Q3 and Q4. Given that, um, now, you know, by comparison, 
a four point something percent GDP growth for a economy that is as large as China is nothing to sneeze at as compared to the more mature economies of the US and Europe, um, where we've historically averaged a two to three percent GDP growth on a yearly basis. So there's still quite a bit of opportunity to investing in China and tapping the Chinese market. The only issue that folks need to be aware of and be careful of is China's economy is mostly directed, government directed, uh, in the sense that it is not completely a free economy. And therefore, when you're making investments, you need to be aware of where the government is trying to put their money. So if you're, if you're investing in industries where the government has said, look, we need to specifically invest in this industry, like semiconductors, like infrastructure, like energy, um, then you have the wind in your sails, right? Because the government's also putting in money into it. Now, if you are unfortunately didn't check the news and decide to invest in industries that the government has basically said, we're not going to encourage, like Bitcoin mining, um, then I'm sorry, right? You're, you're not going to get a great deal of growth. So there's an extra level of be aware of where the political wind is going, not because you are concerned about the political wind, but because of economic reality. Government investments actually make a huge difference in the growth of an industry in China. And you have to be aware of it when you're making investments in China. But are there opportunities for investment in China? Absolutely. It's running at a much higher growth pace than some of the other countries that we could name. Larry? Thank you. Look for the wind in the sails. Uh, Diane, and I pass the uh, same question over to you. Uh, your, op your perspectives on opportunities and the challenges uh, to them. Well, thank you, Larry. I'd like to uh, jump off from where Lisa was ending with this directions that are set by the government. I think everyone's heard of the famous five-year plans. Um, they are real and they are important for how local governments also choose to make their own investment decisions and their own how they prioritize their work. So while the go central government establishes these directional winds, I like that, um, the actual execution passes down to the provinces and the province, provincial governors to the cities and cities down to the districts and districts down to the countryside. And it's this pyramid structure is what makes China quite special. So while we look at uh, China from the outside and say, oh, it's centrally planned, actually once it steps down to the execution level, it's quite independent. And the government leaders in, in you know, whether they're a district head or a governor, they're looking to fulfill KPIs and they're left to their own devices as whether they take out more debt or where they, you know, they focus on which industries and how they do that. And that's where the business comes in, because we don't partner with the with the central government. We we partner with local governments, and this word of partnership has changed a lot in the thirty years that I've been here. In that originally joint ventures was required for every industry, every kind of company, and then the business community went through a love fest with for wholly foreign owned enterprises where we all did our own thing, green fields. Um, and today we've gone back to an appreciation for what a joint venture can do for us. So when one is looking at opportunities in China, one of the most important aspects is to really appreciate that this, what I call partnership plus, in that a, a local company actually is your, can be your best supporter. And they bring the market with them. They can bring um, the network to get things done the famous you know, efficiencies of China. Um, at the same time, they, they might even bring technology. And this is a new opportunity that's been developing over the last five years. It is company, it used to be, or it, it, it's a misconception or a perception that 
foreign companies come with technology. And it's true, there's a lot of technologies in different industries that are still needed, um, such as in agriculture. In agriculture, uh, this is one of the big areas of growth that's been identified in the current five-year plan, the, two, the 14th five-year plan. But at the same time, China has been industrializing um, and innovating in other areas. And those companies now have technologies to sell. So a company from the US might come to China and for the market, partner their own abilities, their own supply chain efficiencies, their management skills with the Chinese who have a tech special technology that they know how to, to grow and actually take global. So um, that was a, a, a new development and opportunities there. So the knowing where the uh, local government officials are looking for partnerships and investment is a good way uh, to find your opportunities. And the last thing I'd like to say is, um, is in the markets themselves where most of the industries and markets are open for investment. There's very few now, we've heard the negative list, right? And the negative list, it's probably, you know, these have to be very, very large and go to Beijing for approval. But as you're just making carpets or, you know, selling a certain business product or services, the government is no more in your face than taxes, um, administrative approvals, and, and, you know, that kind of activity. It's really you and the market. And right now in the market, um, a challenge for most companies is how quick the Chinese competitors are. Uh, when we do surveys with a lot of our clients, the number one issue they talk about, and it doesn't matter if it's a gaming company, a tire manufacturer, um, you know, an online service company, they all say the same thing. The competition is intense because the Chinese respond very quickly to the needs of their own market. And that actually is a good reason, another good reason to have a Chinese partner um, to help navigate and pr propose new ideas on how to be in this market. Thank you, Larry. Be, be ready to move quickly. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> all right. Peter, can I uh, turn over to you that same question, that balance of opportunities and the challenges to get there? Yeah. <clears throat> Well, I'll start with the challenges because I think there are two challenges that are very large. Um, one I touched on earlier, which is just the lack of understanding of China, how it works, its culture, and, and what the implications are for companies doing business there. And, you know, I think we have to remember that, you know, if, if you go back to the Joe Biden quote about eight years ago, he said, look, China is not our enemy. China is our friend. So we have to go back to the idea that this hostility is really very recent. It really came from my point of view when it was pretty apparent that, uh, that the administration really missed the boat on COVID pretty dramatically. And this was a, a political initiative, I think, to basically make China the bad guy and, and the press picked up on it and, and it became very dominant. And, uh, and some of it's understandable. You know, the U.S. has been the global leader economically for 150 years, and we've all heard about American exceptionalism. So the notion that we can learn from somebody else is, is not a very well-established notion in this country. And if you add to that some other just basic beliefs, I think as soon as you put the tag communism on China, people immediately say, oh, well, China's communist, um, Russia's communist, and they were a failed state. And therefore, China is just a matter of time until they go down. And I wish I had a dime for every book that's been written on the coming collapse of China. I mean, it's, you, you literally could fill bookshelves with it, starting with Gordon Chung a number of years ago. And that was the title of the book, The Coming Collapse of China. Obviously, they've all been proved totally wrong. But it, it's very counterintuitive for Americans to believe that China can be successful for, for two reasons. One is it is not a democracy. And so it's very hard for us to understand that you can actually have a different definition of democracy. Because I know when I started writing my book and I was meeting with Mr. Zhao, who was the former deputy mayor of Shanghai, 
And he said, Pete, we are a democracy. We don't define it as an electoral democracy. We define it as serving the needs of the people. And we think we do that pretty well. Uh, and, and then the second thing that is quite different is China is a managed economy. Uh, but if you look at the fact that the best and the brightest going back to Confucian values have always aspired to government service. Uh, and, and if you think about the fact that we have a divisive political model, they have a unified political model. Doesn't mean there aren't differences in China, but once they complete those five-year plans and those KPIs go out to every industry and every province and every city, uh, everybody's on the same page and they're marching. And, and so to me, it's not a surprise that they're very effective at getting things done. Uh, but this is very counterintuitive. So for most Americans, when you say, could a non-electoral democracy with a centrally managed economy function well? The answer is, of course not. But then you have to go back to the facts. I mean, starting with Deng 40 years ago, reform and opening up, we've had 40 years of unparalleled prosperity and economic growth in China that's gone through lots of ups and downs, started with almost a wasteland after the Cultural Revolution, and, uh, and they pulled it off. Uh, and, and then the other thing is when you, when, you, when you listen to the challenge of the oppressed unhappy people, when you look at the Edelman survey on trust, and when you look at the Pew Foundation research, Chinese people rate their government far higher than Americans rate their government. And a part, it's a philosophy. You know, the Chinese people have always been centralized and, and, and it's up to the leaders to maintain the mantle of heaven and to stay in power. In the US, we started with a minimalist constitution with the idea that the less the government does, the better off we'll, we'll all be. And we will be, be defined by our economy, which of course cannot be centrally managed because we started with a minimalist model. So uh, to, to me, challenge number one is overcoming the lack of understanding. And I'm pretty pessimistic having been in this space now for quite a while, that there's any appetite. I think if you ask your average congressman a third, a third grade question about the history and culture of China, most of them would flunk on, on, on even very basic things. Now, the, the other challenge that is concurrent with the US lack of understanding is the tension in China now between its historic approach to pragmatism and the economy and ideology. And ideology uh, is coming into play in a way that it hasn't for quite some time. But, uh, you know, ideological issues, uh, you know, include things like uh, the notion of income inequality and co-prosperity which was a big she theme a while ago. It's not so much a theme anymore, but that was the whole notion of kind of socialism and redistribution of wealth. Um, if, if you look at the, uh, the issue of SOEs versus private enterprise, uh, she has been quite outspoken in, in looking to rejuvenate SOEs, even though having worked with many of them, I can say flatly, it's not going to happen because the, the senior leadership teams are driven in a very simple model. I remember working for uh, one of the biggest insurance companies, the SOE, and I, and I said to the CEO, I said, you know, your property casualty strategy, which is something I've spent a lifetime on, is dead wrong. He said, Pete, I couldn't agree with you more. And I said, well, he reports to you, so what are you doing about it? And he said, you don't understand that he actually reports to the organization committee of the party. I have no direct control over my direct reports. And in fact, I'm thinking about what my next assignment's going to be. So if you've got somebody who is looking over their shoulder and thinking about not doing today's job, but tomorrow's job, running a company, you're going to get an ROE, which they have as SOEs, around 7%, private sector 15%. So, so the idea of tilting towards SOEs because there's more government control is, a, is going to be a threat to the economy. And if you look at COVID, we have the same issue. I mean, most people who have kind of studied what's going on with COVID 
would say that the zero tolerance approach was exactly right when you had low frequency, high severity. It is not right when you've got low frequency, I mean, high frequency and low severity. Uh, and, and yet the government seems very reluctant to quote, appear to be changing its position on that subject. And so there, there are a couple of other areas like that where there are real tensions. And, and I think what's going to square it ultimately for both the US and for China is the fact that it's the economy stupid. And, and if there's one thing that China understands is that the people really don't care about ideology. They care everything about their standard of living and the quality of everyday life. And, 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 and if because of some of these tensions on ideological ideology versus the economy leads the China GDP to slip from its five, six percent down to one, two percent, there will be reverberations. And, and, and while everyone talks about Xi as the supreme leader, I think that's absolutely true as long as the economy is humming. If the economy is not humming, a very talented group of people in the Central Committee and the Politburo and the Standing Committee are going to be having more of a say on how trade-offs get made. And, and I thought it was very interesting that uh, the, the recent notion of co-prosperity, which was mentioned, I think, 35 times in the original speech, in Lee's last speech, it was not mentioned at all. Uh, and I'm sure it's because there are some heavyweights in China who basically said, it's about the economy and we're not gonna mess with it. So, so, so to me, th that those two challenges are real. I, I think the, out, the hope going forward to me is the business community. I mean, when you meet senior executives of companies that have been in China for a long time, you do not have to explain to them that the government is in charge. You don't have to explain to them that you better be aligned with five-year plans or you're gonna be not gonna have the wind at your back. You don't have to explain to them face actually still matters. So the idea that Biden kind of calls up Xi and says, we are warning you not to support uh, Russia. I mean, just imagine how that is received in a Chinese culture. And, and, and that's so one-on-one. -on -one. So, so my hope basically is that the business communities in the US and China will, will realize that this is not a time to raise your head up high. And I've had this discussions with many senior people. They say, do not ask us to go public on anything that can be interpreted as support for China because we're going to get our head taken off. Uh, but I do think that ultimately when the economies in both countries start to suffer, the, the economy and the corporate world is going to be front and center. And, and they have an opportunity, I think, to tell, to show the government how to turn down the heat on the issues of trade and tariffs and visas and students uh, and technology restrictions and everything else uh, and, and, and be able to identify what the economic upside of creating genuine win-wins is. But that to me is the opportunity. I have very little confidence that the governments on either side are gonna crack this code. Uh, but if you look at who understands the other side and who has the economic motivation, businesses to solve this problem, uh, that's where we got the wind at our back. And that's, where, that's the group that's gotta get mobilized. Thank you, Pete. But, um, and I, I heard through all of those, uh, some real actionable, items. <clears throat> we may have time to circle back uh, to that. I, I do have uh, a couple of questions that, from uh, our participants. And so what I'd like to do is to uh, pose these. Uh, I'll combine the theme here and, uh, and pose them to you. And uh, I suppose that it's the, uh, it's the dragon in the room that shouldn't be avoided. <clears throat> so it's, uh, it's a two- I'll read them here. Is it how do we get back to better relations uh, in uh, in the atmosphere between the two countries? And a more specific version of the same question are the effects of the changing tides in the financial relationships between the two countries as China enters its version of quantitative easing 
Um, and while U.S. policymakers are veering towards more hawkish policies um, and uh, to uh, combat inflation. So uh, it's the, the question here is the relationships in the light of the financial realities that we're all having to uh, uh, to take. Uh, anybody want to raise their hand to uh, to address that one? It sort of goes against your theme, Peter, of uh, <clears throat> don't talk about political issues in, when you're trying to do business. <clears throat> but uh, uh, but it's well, maybe, yeah. Go sorry, ahead. maybe I'll I'll set a stage a little bit. Um, again, this goes with my historical experience. This is not the only time that the U.S. and China have had bad relations. This is one of a series. You know, if you think of a marriage, <laughs> marriages are not smooth the entire time, and we have decades of, you know, of good times, and then we may have five years of, a, of some struggles and tensions. Um, China and the U.S., I agree with Peter's comment that, that the understanding, the, the um, responsibility for understanding the other party has definitely fallen to the Chinese. And back in the beginning, you know, Deng Xiaoping was very clear, the rest of the world is not going to learn Chinese, we're going to have to learn English. And thus, the um, responsibility, to be honest, I, has fallen a lot to the Chinese to be the communication channels. Um, with that said, over time, there have been struggles and, the, you know, we cannot forget June 4th, it must be mentioned. For two years, the Hilton Hotel in Shanghai was almost empty. So we get through these periods and it's based on people to people, keeping the connections, doing the businesses, visiting each other, learning and pushing forward. And the governments come around for whatever, whatever is the, the mechanism for changing directions. Um, and the Chinese people firmly believe this is just a moment in time. This is just a moment in 5,000 years of history. This is not, history is not stopped today. And I think that emphatic statement style of speaking is what, which comes from the US side. Um, is what irritates, um, as though we've all stopped living. Tomorrow it's over, you know, this is it. You know? <laughs> in reality, we all have a chance to make an impact and to push it forward. And if economics is a great uh, leveler, it's the pragmatic voice in the room. It's what really makes, it's, real, it's what's meaningful. So um, in, in that regard, this is not the end of the earth. This is just a moment in time. We all have to work together and move forward. Avoid the emphatic style of speaking. That's so nicely put. <laughs> um, Lisa or Peter, Pete, uh, any comments on, on this thought? Yeah, I, um, as I said, I, I would go back and say the real foundational lever is the economy itself. Um, the rhetoric from the U.S. that is uninformed and the tension between ideology and economy, uh, which is very much rooted in Xi, uh, are, are not either going to be strong enough to compensate for how people react to a disappointing economy. So I think the notion of doing everything, uh, starting with the large companies in China and here, who are doing business in the other country, anything that can be done to begin to quantify what the real impact is of this schism could be extremely helpful. Because you know, if the US comes in at a flat uh, GDP growth or China comes in at a 2% GDP growth, there are gonna be an awful lot of questions to senior people. And then people are gonna say things like, well, do you know those those technology restrictions that we put in place, when you look at the impact of them through the entire economy, is costing us 1% of GDP. And here's how many jobs that affects. And do you know that by continuing tariffs and the trade restrictions that we've got, that we're limiting what we can do. And by limiting the number of Chinese students who can study in America, here's the price we're paying for that. So I, I, I think if you get the top 50 corporations doing business in China. And someone told me recently that 
Hank Greenberg, bless his heart, at age 97, having started AIG so many years ago, is leading the charge. And apparently over half the company's CEOs have signed up to taking a much bolder stand with the US government on what price we're paying with the restrictions that are being put in place with the ongoing trade tension. And I think the same is going to happen in China. You know, I, I think the I, ideology is great as long as the economy is humming. When the economy is not humming, nobody cares. And, and, then, and then the questions are going to go out, how do we get a lift in our economy? And, and when that happens, everybody's going to be happy. And, and, and that's why I think the business communities on both sides are absolutely central to solving it. Lisa, oh. you want to weigh in on this one? Sure. Um, I have a slightly more pessimistic view of the uh, U.S.-China relationship right now. Um, yes, it is a moment in time, but if you look at it, zooming out kind of at the 6,000 feet level, you are dealing with a rising economic and political power challenging a dominant world power that has been dominant for the last 70 years after World War II. It is, you, you should expect friction um, when you're doing business as between US and China. There will be friction because there is that historical backdrop to it. Um, you are also seeing that both countries on a political scale are pulling away from each other. So the US is trying to reshore uh, some of their production manufacturing, um, potentially driving a lot of the semiconductor manufacturing back into US or they're attempting to. Uh, China is putting a great deal of effort into uh, being able to independently uh, manufacturing their semiconductor industry. Um, and both sides understand very well that if they could cooperate, um, the industry development would go much quicker and it would be a lot cheaper. But both sides decide that at least for semiconductor and some other rather critical for development industries, um, they view or are jockeying for position as to making sure that the other side could not block them in future developments. So under those circumstances, I agree with Pete that the business community would, would be a major voice um, in providing the counterweight or the counter argument of, hey, pulling us pulling apart and essentially making this a split global manufacturing or split global technology development is not a good idea. Um, but at this point, politics in both countries are making it relatively difficult. Um, and you see that more in the US because the policies in the US is so open, verbose, and in your face. But there's quite a bit of political pressure within the, within the Chinese community as well regarding, no, no, we need to develop this in-house. We, we, we really should not be using kind of foreign technology. So for example, uh, the Chinese government very recently asked all of its governmental agency to switch out uh, the, the laptops and the computers that they use um, from Western produced, Western brand to kind of China brand laptop. Um, the US has done the same thing where they're saying, hey, critical infrastructure, you need to not use uh, the 5G uh, kind of gearbox for Huawei. Um, and so businesses at this point are being very ginger in what they say, just like Pete says, a lot of the senior uh, executives of US companies are saying, hey, my business is very well helped by Chinese engagement, but if you want me individually as a business to go and lobby Washington, then that's a no-go because I know my head's gonna be taken off. 
So I think we need to find a way to do this collectively um, and also find a way to uh, gain small wins to demonstrate that, hey, having cooperation actually does not cause difficulties on the uh, security scenario, um, but on the other hand, does benefit um, people of both countries. And that is more in the implementation. Um, and the money flowing is still flowing. So that gives me some comfort. Larry? Thank you. Uh, can I go around the room? There's been a number of actionable uh, recommendations here. Um, find the wind in the sails. Um, find the partner plus. Um, develop a better understanding. These are all um, excellent pieces of advice. Um, any suggestions on the next step, which is where to go to get that information and where to go uh, get those skills? Any, um, if someone is uh, looking to improve their game in terms of uh, doing business with China, where might they get uh, some support? What are some thoughts there? I would suggest that the Chamber of Commerce within China, so AmCham, BritCham, EuroCham, those are very good organizations that have, I think AmCham just passed its 100th anniversary in Shanghai. Um, and AmCham is also in Beijing and in Guangzhou. So depending on geographically where you are, if you're working with Chinese um, business partners, having a relationship with AmCham in the local chapter uh, will get you a lot of resources. Another one? Yeah, I guess I, I'd break it down into two stages. I, I, I um, that... Oh, go ahead, Diane. Go ahead, Diane. No, that's okay. I think my connection is becoming unstable. Oh. <laughs> go ahead, Pete. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I was going to say, Larry, that, you know, I, I think you really have to break it into stages. I, I think the reticence of U.S. corporations to be visibly identified with China in a positive way, uh, that's just a no-go. And I think it's going to be that way for a while. But what I would hope is that the, the CEOs could un look out to maybe three, four years from now and say, it's going to be getting better because the economies are going to be hurting and we're going to need the businesses to be functioning at a much higher level than they are today. So that my question to them is, what would you be doing today behind the scenes if you anticipate that uptick? And I think the things you do is you think about who your partners are going to be, you think about your value proposition, you think about the talent, uh, and, and, and you start putting pressure quietly on the government not directly, but indirectly by pointing out the economic consequences of this decoupling that's going on. Uh, and then when you start to see receptivity, because the economy, stupid, is going to become the number one issue in both countries, then you, you've got your gun loaded, you've got a game plan, your, your contingency plans are ready to go. And, and without ever raising your head in a visible way until you reach that point. Uh, but the, the stakes for the big US players are so huge that for them to find funding to have a, a number of world-class economists to quantify what the consequences are of decoupling would be a drop in the bucket, it's nothing. Um, so I, I don't think there's any resource constraint in the sense of real economics. I think it's the will and the belief that we need to get ready for this and we need to get ahead of the curve and invest for it and anticipate it and not sit, you know, sit back and wait for everything to get better. Be proactive. Thank you. Diane, are you uh, still connected? I hope so. Yep. <laughs> um, yes, there's plenty of resources. There, there's 40 years of those who walked ahead of us in in this entering this market and making a go of it at the beginning as Deng Xiaoping liked to say we're crossing the river by feeling the stones meaning we didn't actually know what we were heading but we knew we had to get to the other side 
Um, Definitely um, the Chinese market has gone, moved beyond that, but there is uh, still an attitude that, look, we, we know what we want to achieve. Let's, let's take some risk here and, and just try. Um, organizationally, I mean, definitely, this is not a time for independent voices, you know, the head that sticks up gets cut off sometimes. There's lots of organizations that companies can join that can be those resources, those face to the outer world and they can combine their opinions and they can get a message across. Um, Heartland Association, I mean, let's, an organization like this is very, very important because it is at a subnational level um, and it approaches from a natural attitude. We're making bridges here. If you notice my background, there's a bridge. <laughs> you can't cross a bridge. You can't cross a river without a bridge. That's for sure. And, and we need to do that. And, and the attitude is to be open-minded and we have to be open-minded. Locally, yes, on the ground. If you want a 36,000 feet, don't forget our US government. Uh, they do have representation here, both through the Commerce Department and the Ag. Foreign, uh, foreign Affairs, uh, Foreign Agriculture Office, FAO, they tend to, to hover at a much higher level, you know, condense the figures from the whole country into one office. But that at least gives you a framework from which to work. And the Commerce Department is the same, and they're, they're tied in with the, the chambers, the American Chamber of Commerce here in Shanghai. Actually, I think we're coming up to 110 years now. <laughs> of course, there was a break in between. So do understand that it was in a continuous 100 years. Um, and through the connection of the chamber itself, then you meet members and there are members who have done, you join um, industrial committees and those industrial committees work together to share information. Incredibly open-minded and willing to be uh, uh, generous with their experiences and their information. And that is interesting. You know, in America, we might be competitors of another, um, ships manufacturer, and we won't share that information. But here, let's say you're an agricultural service company and you reach out to other ag, ag companies, they're willing to sit down round table over breakfast, eight people and, and share with you their learning. So I think we should take advantage of all those as resources. In, you, in, hmm, sorry, go ahead. I'm just gonna say that's a perfect segue. Uh, the participants should look uh, in the chat box. Uh, there are links to uh, information about each of the panelists and to each of the organizations that are here uh, uh, present today. So, uh, and I noticed that there are, um, uh, and also uh, both of these organizations uh, do better with more membership. So if you uh, like what you heard today, um, you are invited to uh, pursue information about us and, and uh, join if you care to. Uh, hey, we're at the top of the hour. <laughs> I would like to uh, thank you very much for your participation, uh, panelists uh, from uh, all corners of the uh, of the uh, of the globe, and, and uh, our uh, my staff coming in to clean. Apparently, they're in the background. So, thank you all um, for your participation today, and uh, we uh, appreciate, uh, particularly uh, Diane staying up late, and uh, we uh, uh, we enjoyed this very much. I, I took a lot of notes, learned a lot of things myself. Uh, please come and join us for the next uh, events from both of these organizations. Thank you all and, and good day and good morning.